the governor. And uh, Matt, good morning to you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Good morning. It was quite a game. That's what Super Bowls are supposed to be. So yeah, did, thoroughly did, enjoyable last night. Did you uh, did you have a team you wanted to win last night? Well, I was kind of pulling for the 49ers, but uh, you know when they handed that ball back over to Mahomes, the 49ers only scored a field goal. I think everybody knew that uh, knew what was coming. Yeah, you can't bet against Mahomes, man. He he's just money. Uh, you know, I mean, he's a competitor. You you got to. You got to kill him to beat him. You, he's just too good. You know, he's he's got that drive, right? Like a vampire, you got to drive a stake through the heart to stop him. How old is he? He looks 28, 28, 28 years old. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hey, Mac. There are three parts to last night. There's a game itself. There's the uh, uh, halftime uh, entertainment and the commercials. Uh, how do you grade all three of them? Well, I certainly put the game above the other two. I didn't mm-hmm. watch the halftime and the commercials. Just didn't do much for me. Yeah. So. Uh, I'll have to go the game. I think the commercials were a little bit better than they've been the last five years. I was listening a couple of years ago to an interview about uh, why the commercials aren't as fun and creative as they used to be with a couple of ad execs, some creative people, and they said because everybody is afraid of offending everybody yep. now. You, you are just so afraid of offending even one person with an ad that it just takes all the creativity and fun out of the ads. Plus, I did not understand a lot of the uh, commercials. Makes me feel kind of old, I guess. But I, the, 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 the target audience is a much younger group, so I did not understand them. Well, it's that feeling you get when you're look, looking at the screen, you know, oh, that's probably a famous person. That's why this is important. I have no idea who they are. <laughs> well, it's hard to understand it when you're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Mac, last week you attended the Winter Conference of the National Association of Secretaries of State in Washington, D.C., and you were actually in attendance at the Supreme Court arguments on the decision of Colorado's Secretary of State and Maine's to not allow Donald Trump to be on the ballot. What did you think of those proceedings as you observed them? Well, it was very interesting, especially given the fact that West Virginia had filed an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, in favor of um, – Interestingly enough, it wasn't in favor of one side or the other. It was just in favor of the ministerial role of the Secretary of State, simply say that our job as secretaries is not to make a determination of who should be on the ballot, who shouldn't, but to simply, if somebody is qualified, then to ensure that their names get on the ballot. So that's what our argument was. I'm hopeful, quite hopeful, I think everybody's leaning towards uh, the Supreme Court handing down the decision that uh, says just that. Uh, the, the justices, even many, several of the liberal or progressive judges, were asking tough questions of the, uh, the side that was arguing in favor of the Colorado uh, Secretary of State. She had made a determination that in, in the law it's called ultra barriers, outside the authority. Now, we don't think that she had the authority to make the call that she did. And uh, then, of course, the Colorado Supreme Court uh, decided in a close vote to uphold her decision. And that's why you know, the Supreme Court, we don't want individual states making determinations as to who should be on the ballot, who should. You can imagine the patchwork across the United States of Democrat states kicking Republicans off, Republican states kicking Democrats off. And then somebody is deciding other than the people, other than the voters, who is the president. So uh, I think we're going to come out with the right decision. That's why West Virginia filed on behalf of the, the role that it says. Our job is not to make those judgments. It, that, that puts me, or the secretaries, in the job of judge, jury, and executioner, you know, deciding the facts. In this case, it was whether there was an insurrection or not. And I don't think there was. I think that it was a mob or a riot that got out of control, but certainly wasn't a, a, a coordinated effort to overthrow the government. So that's what I don't want secretaries people like me in that role of making those determinations and keeping people off the ballot because of my decision. Mac, you're getting a little quieter as you go along here, so I'm not sure if you can pump up your volume a little bit more or not, but that would be helpful uh, if you can. Uh, the the present, I think the, the road we're going down uh, with some of these maneuvers that we're making on both sides of the aisle, uh, I think are very dangerous. Uh, I, have, I look. I, I look at uh, the, you. Still with us, Mac? Yes. Uh, some of the yes, can you hear me? yes. You're doing great there. Some of the impeachment proceedings that we've been trading back and forth with, depending on who's in power. I think uh, we're, we're really going down the wrong road here, Mac, in terms of how to govern this country. 
I, I think I think so as well. That's why we need to leave this up to uh, the people in the election process. That we've been in there for 250 years or so, uh, and not go down this political politicized uh, role where uh, people in, in these official capacities start politicizing their offices. We do not want that. Bill, yeah, uh, picking up on that, I think you. Uh, what you're parroting and what you're saying is a gist I'm getting from a lot of analysts uh, that the Supreme Court will actually uh, rule with a fairly large number, uh, uh, eight to one or perhaps nine to zero, all of saying this is not the state's role. Uh, it should be a congressional role of what of who should or should not be on the ballot. Uh, so I think that the, I don't think insurrection is going to be mentioned. I don't think Trump's going to be mentioned. It's going to be strictly the, the role, the, how much power the state has of keeping someone off a particular ballot. Yeah. That, that's all. We have three branches of government. Yeah. You have a, a court, you have the executive, and then you have the legislative. We need to each stay in our own lanes, and then that allows us to have that check and balance on each other. Uh, and without it, uh, you go down this slippery path of um, basically not having elections uh, mean what they're supposed to mean in a democratic process. Yeah. Mac, during the, let's go to the political debate, uh, the gubernatorial debate that you had last week uh, with uh, Chris Miller, Moore Capito, and Patrick Marcy. Uh, Marcy uh, used the term political royalty. Uh, do you believe he was including you in this category? Well, he may not have there, but uh, he took a shot later on about uh, people on the ballot. Uh, he was making a reference, I'm sure, to my brother Chris being on the ballot when it was Secretary of State. And, uh, you know, my brother Chris was and, – and I'm not endorsing him. I don't get into that, but just whether it's him or anybody else. Chris was earning his stripes in the Republican Party back when Patrick Morrissey was still in New Jersey running and losing the race for Congress. Uh, Chris has been in the Republican Party for a long, long time and working as an activist in the Republican Party. He, you know, the Warners were Republican back when it wasn't cool to be Republican in West Virginia. So it was a cheap shot, but I don't think it landed, didn't, didn't do anything. Uh, his, his other effort was to try to knock off uh, more Capito and uh, Chris Miller, uh, you know, putting the title political royalty on air. Uh, and again, I just think people look at the candidates and what they bring to the to the fore, uh, rather than their name. Did uh, as a participant of the debate, you, it's kind of hard to judge uh, uh, the relative merits. But did you come away feeling that uh, that you had made the points that you wanted to make or you wished to make? Well, about half of them, the forum didn't allow itself to, to let us get into uh, some more of the meaty issues that I think we needed to address. Um, and Hoppy let uh, both Moore Capito and Patrick Morrissey talk way too long. I think we put a shot clock on the, the uh, time. Morrissey probably got close to half of the time. Uh, Moore Capito was right up there with him. And, uh, and then Chris Miller and I did just near the amount of time. So it, it's difficult. It's just not our nature to interrupt. You know, when you're from West Virginia, you have more of a uh, conservative or respectful approach. And, Patrick Morris, he just talks over top of people and keeps talking once he gets to the floor. Uh, so he answered that. So I, I, the time that I did have, I think I, I was effective, uh, but I would like to have more time to explain, say, the economic policies, the education policies, those sorts of things that I want to accomplish for the state of West Virginia, and I'm still looking for a good opportunity to do that. Right after the debate, I received a press release from your camp that said uh, Secretary of State Warner emerges as the education candidate. And I talked to uh, some people who watched the debate, and I said, uh, do you think this is a hype press release, uh, or did you actually get that feeling as you watched the debate? And the answer was, yes, you actually did come across as the education candidate out of that debate. Was that your plan going in, Mac, or did it just emerge because of the way the answers and questions flowed? Well, probably both. I, I am the education uh, candidate. That's the focus of my, will be the focus of my administration. Uh, when we fix education, then we fix a whole lot of other problems, and uh, everything begins with education. We have to have children reading at grade level by the third grade, or otherwise they fall further and further behind. It's hard for them to enter the workforce without the proper education. When you have the education, 
you're solving, you're educating people about the opioid crisis. You're educating people about the health crisis, obesity, those sorts of things. And you're getting children prepared for uh, what, what lies ahead of being an entrepreneur and starting businesses. So everything pretty much resolves around education. And you're building communities when you're building education, getting people school choices and parents to be involved in the process. That's what people rally around. And so things like the consolidation of cool schools, I, I may have mentioned that this, when you're running a business, you need to be efficient. You're worried about a profit and paying your people and so forth. The government needs to be effective as opposed to, to efficient. Now, you'd like to have both, but when, when there's a flood or some sort of disaster, a, a government isn't worried about you know, the lowest cost or whatever. You've got to solve that problem for people. We have to protect people from before they're born all the way until you know, they're senior citizens and worried about prescription drug prices and those sorts of things. So that's what the government's job is, is to do what people can't do for themselves and it all begins with education. Mac, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. I, I want to drill down on the education piece a, a little bit. You've been part of the government now for quite some time, and you've had an opportunity, certainly a, a, a lot of time, to observe what is broken within the education system and to sort of dream about how to go about fixing it. So if you're governor on the first day as the education governor, what, what concrete thing are you are you going to do what string are you going to pull first well we've got to get qualified teachers in the classrooms and right now there are any number of estimates from 1200 to 1600 openings that uh, need to be filled and, and i've been around to the high schools and in the, in the elementary schools and I've, I've talked to people and yes getting teachers into the classroom and keeping them there is probably the number one thing we have to, to work on so we do have to continue to work on the, the pay, we have to work on the benefits, PEI, those sorts of issues that uh, come up. But a lot of the teachers are saying that it's it's more than just pay. It's the discipline in the classroom and dealing with those uh, problem students. And I've, I've heard various uh, possible solutions to that. I've looked at the early childhood education from birth to three and then pre-K and, and then K to 12, those block, looking at those sorts of uh, areas of, of education if we want people, parents in the workforce, we have to provide them and help with that preschool uh, education, the, the uh, early childhood development. And it's not just babysitting. It's actually working with the children. So I was at Cubby's. It's the name of it's a uh, uh, child care center. I think it's the largest one in the state in Bridgeport just a week or so ago. And I saw empty classrooms. They, they have about 400 children, but they have a waiting list of about 380 but they can't get the teachers to fill those darkened classrooms. And so we, we have to look at the early childhood education just as we do with other uh, aspects or as you get more uh, the elementary school and middle school, high school uh, age uh, teachers. We need to look at across the board getting teachers into the classrooms in West Virginia. And I think the government has a role in helping. In fact, I heard uh, Roger Hanshaw, the Speaker of the House, say that this year when he talked to the Chamber of Commerce, what was the number one thing that the Chamber of Commerce said they needed? It was early childhood development, uh, you know, helping parents with, with child care. So uh, that, that's where I'm going to be focusing to answer your question. And just focusing on the teacher piece then, how if stipulate we need better pay, we need to fix PEIA. And all, so are you proposing that as governor in, in the first weeks of your administration, you're going to propose legislation or I don't know if Virginia has or West Virginia has executive orders or not. But what specific what, what can you do to fast track what is clearly an emergent issue within the state? I mean, we know what it's we can identify what the problems are. Those are clear less clear from anybody I've, I've talked to is, well, okay, we know what we have to fix, but how specifically do you fix it? Well, as opposed to perhaps some of the other candidates, I don't propose to have you know the answer to everything. What I have is an approach to addressing these issues. And the approach that I have is I'm, I'm very pleased now with the legislature having 100 single member districts. Everybody in the state now knows who their specific delegate is. We don't have these um, multi-member districts and, and that sort of thing. And so I believe in the legislative process. And these people, you've got some great delegates and, and senators from out in the Eastern Panhandle, and they have different issues than those people in the Southern Coldfields. And so we have to 
it may not be a one size fits all. It may need to, to have special, you know, localized pay and those sorts of issues. We need to look at that. But then it has to go through the legislative process, through the finance committees of the House and Senate, because it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to give all these the, the pay raises and make us competitive with Pennsylvania and Ohio and so forth. But where's that money coming from? And if you don't have a funding source for it, then where are you pulling away from? What priorities are you not going to look at? And that's why I think we have to work through the legislative process and why I'm the best candidate to do that. I've been building teams and doing the collaboration my entire career. You know, I've got this military background, and that's what the military teaches you to do, is to form the task force, look at the issues, develop alternatives, and then pick the, the one that best addresses the issue that doesn't bust the bank. So uh, I've got the process. That's what the, the military has trained me and the State Department and other places that I've worked this job myself is building the teamwork, being effective and efficient where you can, and reaching a solution that together collaboratively so you don't bust the bank or promise something over promise and under deliver Bill? yeah uh mac going back to uh the campaign or going to the campaign uh back in november uh, uh general michael flynn uh uh endorsed you uh I've not seen any follow-up on that. And in fact, I have not seen a lot of ads. Are you going to incorporate that endorsement in your ads and be more aggressive pushing this? And kind of aside, at that time, you're hoping that President Trump might endorse you as well. Is anything developed along that front? I, I will be incorporating uh, the Michael Flynn endorsement, probably new sound bites and some radio ads, that sort of thing. Uh, the main thing is to know, for people to know that he understands who I am, understands what I bring to the table. Just a week or so ago, I got the Michelle Bachman's endorsement. She was a former presidential candidate, a very active uh, congresswoman. And so uh, these, these endorsements will continue to come, and there will be a time to play those. It's just uh, we're still a few months, three, three months out from this election, so uh, there's a timing issue on when you uh, play those cards. I, I'm, I'm noticed with a couple of exceptions, Craig Blair and more recently Eric Household. There's not been a lot of advertising or campaigning up to this point in time. I, I thought a couple of three months out from the election there'd be a lot more campaigning than what I'm seeing. It's not just you; it's across the board. Well, the, the legislature is in session, and I'm actually pleased to see that they are paying attention to state's business as opposed to self-promotion and that sort of thing. And certainly that's what I've been doing as well. I've been getting around, and uh, I've probably been to close to 30 county clerk's offices now in the last uh, few months looking at the machines. Are we ready uh, to uh, have this 2024 uh, election? Uh, are they prepared? We had 17 new clerks, and I'm trying to get each of their offices uh, to make sure that there's no, a lot of times they will tell you something in person that they won't tell you over the phone or raise their hand and bring attention to themselves. So that's why these visits are so important. And so uh, that's the, the, what, what I'm doing right now as well as we're preparing for uh, poll worker training, getting the videos ready uh, to, to distribute to the, to the clerks for their use with poll workers. Within this active campaign you all have me on talking about trying to recruit poll workers. And I think West Virginia is probably in a better shape than some of these other states because of that. Other states are now looking and calling and asking what we're doing, how, why we're being successful. The Elections Assistance Commission actually used a video from me to send nationwide as to what's going on in West Virginia. So we're paying attention to the people's business. It's, there will be time for campaigning ahead. Are we using the same machines throughout the state? We are, for the first time, all 55 counties will have the express vote system. I think it's the best system going. It's got the voter-verified paper trail. It has the tabulator that gives you results on election night, which is what everybody wants. But it keeps that paper trail in case there's any discrepancy. The paper controls over the electronic. But we never had a discrepancy uh, in, that, uh, in that system. It, I was told that we've had about a handful of cases where there was a discrepancy in the audit between the hand count and the uh, tabulator, and when they went back to check it again, it was the hand count that was off, not the tabulator. So we've never had a problem with electronic tabulation of the ballots here in West Virginia. We do have a couple of counties that are still using predominantly a, a paper ballot, a hand-marked paper ballot, which is fine. People can request that if they want. But uh, both, in both cases, they said they had a 
more elderly uh, voting population, that they were just more comfortable with paper. But the point to be made here is that all 55 counties now do have the express vote system that will be available. And uh, when we use that, we have the most efficient uh, tabulation and the quickest tabulation so that we get those results on election night, which is what everybody wants to add to confidence to the voters that nothing nefarious is happening with the, with the vote count. You know, Matt, it occurs to me that in the um, in the wake of the Colorado Supreme Court uh, case and such, until 2000 and the the Florida hanging Chad business with the the Bush Gore election, I personally was never aware of the state secretary of state as anything other than sort of an administrative function. And then it arose that there is a political, true, polit- hardcore political element to being secretary of state first of all is that a true observation and has it become more and more a political position and certainly in light of what's happening in colorado what's trying to happen in colorado that's an astute observation i I would put the timeline up to about 2016 i think up until then there wasn't much attention being paid to the secretaries of state but the potential for cyber hacking the the hacking of, of systems. Uh, the computers now were in full force. Uh, cell phones, that sort of thing, uh, were uh, common, ubiquitous, you know, across the, the spectrum. Personally, uh, government officials, election systems, and so on. And so it was that threat to that system that caused the federal government to name elections as critical infrastructure, just like Wall Street and the transportation, the nuclear power. Those are critical infrastructure. We have about 16 elements of our uh, national uh, administration, basically, that are critical infrastructure. So when they put elections on the same level as you know, our, our nuclear power plants and water systems and so on, we knew something was different. It, there was a chance of some outsider interfering to the point where they could change the outcome of an election. And that's where the attention started being placed on who was in these offices, uh, the, the opportunity that they had to pick the the type of machines that their states were using, uh, voting systems, voting by mail, uh, same-day registration, uh, all those sorts of aspects that you don't really think of until you actually get into what they call the ecosystem of the uh, election system. So all these things became important, and that's when I think the politicization started to occur, when you started to see states say, well, you're going to send out ballots to everybody. If you're just registered, we're going to send them out to you. And in West Virginia, as you know, We've taken off over 400,000 names from our lists, and if we hadn't done that, those ballots would have been, when we started to go to vote by mail, we would have had 400,000 ballots out of somebody's mailbox. You can imagine the opportunities for fraud and uh, bad activities to occur. So now all of a sudden you start having people like me in the Secretary of State's office that are making these decisions as to what is free, fair, and that sort of thing. So it has become politicized, and it shouldn't be. It should be. I want to get back to election day, not election season. I want to make sure that somebody that's registered is properly registered, a citizen, 18 years old, and that sort of thing. And that's why I vigorously pursue any fraud that comes up. But uh, I think you're absolutely right that uh, it it has become politicized, but it shouldn't have. And we need to continue to focus on electing people who can distinguish between their personal feelings and personal political beliefs and their job as an administrator of a free election. Mac, I know you have to get going here. Uh, Real quick, last question. Approximately how many registered voters are there in West Virginia? There are about 1.1 million registered voters. About 40% of those are Republican, about 31% are Democrat, and about 24% are non-affiliated. So you have a state of about 1.8 million people. There's 1.1 registered voters, and there was another 400,000 names on top of that that were on the list that shouldn't have been on the list. That's an extraordinary That's percentage of people. It really is. Yeah, that should have rang a bell long ago. Matt, thanks so much for your time, sir. I appreciate it this morning as always. It's always good being with you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Good morning.